upon the Lord. We will wait upon our God. You reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God. The everlasting God. You do not faint. You won't grow. Comfort those in need. You lift us up on wings like eagles. Oh, yes, you do, Lord. Oh, yes. Strength will rise. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. your name Jesus oh yeah oh yeah we stand and lift up we stand and lift up our hands for the joy of the Lord is our strength yes we bow down and worship you now how great how awesome is Together we sing, everyone sing, holy is the Lord, God Almighty, the earth is filled with His glory, holy is the Lord. Worship him now, how great, how awesome is he, and together we sing. is filled with his 
is filled with his glory. The earth, the earth is filled with his glory. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. The earth is filled with your glory, oh God. Hallelujah. You're a holy, oh God. The splendor of the, the splendor, splendor of the King, clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice. Let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light. Oh, yes, you do. And darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great, how great.
sick all the way through the New Testament. And Paul said he had an awesome man in the flesh. He tells the people of Galatia, the reason I stayed so long was because of the ostomia in my flesh. So if you need physical healing, if you need another miracle, you should step out. Maybe you need a job. Uh, I've been asking you to pray for my oldest daughter's husband and my oldest daughter. They've both been out of work for about two years, basically. And he got a job today. Praise God. That's a good job. That's a good job. That's a good job. And uh, so... Uh, he can provide that for you, too. He doesn't start for a month, but at least he knows he's got the job. So that's great. That's great. Any other urgent needs? Okay, if any more, come down and lay hands on these folks. Come on. The Bible says these signs will follow them to believe. It doesn't matter if you're a member of this church. If you believe, come lay hands on people. Okay, the Bible doesn't say it's not. It follows the Sheffield night. It follows them to believe. Okay, we need, we need, every, okay, we need everyone to have hands laid on them. Come on, don't be bashful. Don't be bashful. Pray one for another, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. We're going to believe God together. I'm going to ask each one to pray. Okay, we need some more hands down here laid on people. All right, everybody got someone laying hands on them? Let's all pray together. Please pray like you're the only one praying. Let's seek God tonight. Father, we praise and magnify and glorify the name that's above every name. In the mighty name of your Son, Jesus Christ. We come into your presence rejoicing with thanksgiving, knowing how great is our God, that you're the God that's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You are the unchanging one. You are the, one, the almighty one. You are the great physician. You are the deliverer. You are the striker. And Father, we ask you to come and show off what only you can do tonight. We ask for your healing power where healing is needed. We ask for delivering power where deliverance is needed. We ask for your creative power where it's necessary to recreate. You're the God that knows been healed, as Isaiah says in the 8th chapter when he laid hands on the sick and healed them. Oh, mighty God, in Jesus' mighty name, give your healing power right now. Father, we pray that you'll give encouragement where encouragement is needed. We pray that you'll give strength where strength is needed. Father, we pray for the families that have lost loved ones this week. We pray for Terry Holland family. Father, we pray for... Father, we pray tonight for Hazel Robinson's family that your presence would draw very near. Father, we pray for Joanne Cox and Bobby and Betty Codine. We pray that you'll strengthen. We pray for Ernest Bonwell and Richard and Maddie Paul. God, give the strength that you alone can give during this difficult time. You promise that we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We don't have to fear the evil one because you're with us. You're the God that gives comfort when comfort is needed and strength when strength is needed. You say they that wait on you will exchange their strength. They'll mount up with wings as eagles. They'll run and not be weary and walk and not faint. Father, we pray that everything said and done in every service taking place tonight will glorify the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, for this coming Lord's Day, for Freedom Sunday. We pray that you'll break the bondage of the enemy where it needs to be broken. We pray for a mighty outpouring of your Holy Spirit. Oh, God, we've seen you do it year after year after year as we anoint and pray for every person that attends church on this Sunday. God, we pray that there will be a service that people will remember until the Lord comes because of the outpouring of your Holy Spirit. Father, we pray that you'll touch people, touch families, and as your people invite others to come, anoint them that others might come and meet Jesus Christ as Savior. For we know that he is the only way to God. Almighty Lord Jesus, Father, open the windows of heaven. We're a needy people tonight. Let us leave different than we were when we came in the door. Oh, my Father, my God, touch each person tonight in a very special way. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. How great is our God tonight. Praise the name of the Lord. Oh, mighty Lord Jesus, mighty Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Greet four or five people. Let them know God loves them tonight. Praise God. Then you may be seated, but be sure and greet some folks before you sit down. I think the last time the 4th of July was on a Thursday, we canceled Wednesday night services, but we're glad you're here tonight. 
Okay, we have about 20% of what are usually here, but we're glad you're here and God's here and he's here to minister to our hearts. And we live in exciting times. Prophecy is taking place at warp speed. And we see the things we talked about 50, 60 years ago happening on the front pages of our papers now. And Jesus Christ really is coming back. He really is. Uh, just uh, one announcement. Well, actually two. Sunday is Freedom Sunday. And uh, last year, God really performed some miracles for folks on Freedom Sunday. It was a very unusual Sunday. We pray for everyone in the church on Sunday that wants to be prayed for. And we do that on the 4th of July. Usually, in connection with the 4th of July, I call it Freedom Sunday, areas that you need to be free from. And we ask people to make a, an extra sacrificial gift. We only do that twice a year here. We do it uh, we do it on Christmas service, and we do it on the 4th of July. And uh, so, so let God speak to your heart about what to do. And, and then write down the request. We'll have request cards here. Many of you got them in the mail. And we'll have some Sunday to put your request in up there. And, and those will be prayed for at our prayer meetings and our Thursday services and all the other things that take place here at the church. So remember Freedom Sunday, 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock. There are no Sunday school classes Sunday. Uh, we want families to sit together and come down and have prayer together. And so that's, uh, that's only, a, it's only a couple times a year we do that. And so we want to pray for your whole family, anoint every member of your family, and pray for each member of your family, and believe God to protect and bless and anoint and empower and keep them safe, especially in this day and the things that are going on. And uh, pray that God will protect them and keep them and provide for them and use them for His glory. Uh, we've been advertising an event through a flyer called the TLC Project for July 13th. It was a special clinic to get your pet licensed along with the rabies vaccine, but that event has been canceled. And I think that was canceled by the organization doing it, so we wanted to let you know about that. And I don't very often mention my books. The most often asked questions on Sunday Night Live. Most of you know if you're visiting. Do we have any first-time visitors here tonight? Any first-time guests? Okay, let's give you folks a good chef. You're welcome. I actually did a live Bible question and answer program on television for 24 years, and it was live. We didn't even have a five-second delay. And, and then I wrote a book, The Most Often Asked Questions, the 26 most often asked questions on Sunday Night Alive. And just to mention what's in here, you know, Canaan was cursed. Uh, when Noah came out of the ark, the first thing he did, he got drunk, and his descendants have been added ever since. And uh, when, uh, when he got drunk, he became uncovered in his tent, and he cursed Canaan. And that has been one of the most misused scriptures in the whole Bible. And so we have the curse on Canaan, who was cursed, my opinion of alcohol in our day, why speaking in tongues is for today, why the Christian is not under obligation to keep the Old Testament Sabbath day, and what's the relation of the Christian to the law given at Mount Sinai. And, and I mentioned before, people would call on the TV program and say, do we need to keep the Lord's Day Sunday, or do we need to keep the Old Testament Sabbath, sundown Friday to sundown Saturday? And I'd say yes. I mean, either one. We're not saved by what day we keep. We're saved by who we know. Amen. The Bible says, he that has the Son has, and he that doesn't have the Son doesn't have life. And so they'd say, well, do we have to be baptized in Jesus' name only, or the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? I'd say yes, because we're not saved by formulas. We're saved by relationship. And, and so if you don't know Jesus Christ, you need to open your heart and let him come in. Uh, the church, the rapture, and the great tribulation, which is what we've been talking about on Wednesday nights, why I don't believe in unconditional eternal security. I have to ignore too many verses of Scripture. Uh, where the word Jehovah came from, there's no such word. What, uh, what did the symbol of the fish originate? What does it mean? Uh, what's the Song of Solomon all about? Is Jesus God? Is it necessary to baptize in Jesus' name only? I've already answered that. And that's a long chapter. What does the phrase, the dead in Christ shall rise, mean? What's the seventh seal book of Revelation? And then the shortest chapter in the book, where did Cain get his wife? Uh, what did Jesus mean when he told Nicodemus a man must be born of water and of the Spirit? It's got nothing to do with baptism. Uh, and then chapter 15, but I, I'm sorry, chapter 15, Babylon and Bible prophecy is not Iraq in this day. The United States, Great Britain, and Russia in Bible prophecy. Why the gap theory is not valid. That's where they put a gap between Genesis 1:1. And Genesis 1 2 and pull scriptures out of context and try to prove Satan had a kingdom here on earth and Adam was not the first man. And the Bible, of course, looks at Adam as the first man all the way through. Uh, chapter 18 If I'm going through a difficult time in my life, does it mean I lack faith or I've made a bad confession or there's hidden sin in my life? And I'll tell you why that's not true. Uh, why the struggle of Romans 7, where Paul says, The things I want to do, I can't do, and the things I know I shouldn't do, I do. Why he is not writing as a Christian. He's writing of his previous life as a man trying to be saved by keeping law, and the Bible's very clear on that. 
And then chapter 20, the battleground is the mind. And then the last week of the life of Christ. And I ask this all over the world when I teach. I asked it in Singapore this time. And, you know, Jesus said, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so must the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. There's no way you can be crucified on Friday and be resurrected by the time the sun comes up on Sunday and be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. So was Jesus wrong or are we wrong? <laughs> the answer is obvious. He couldn't have been crucified on Friday. And that's nothing new. That's been taught since the earliest church that he wasn't crucified on Friday. We have the information in here. And then the 26 pictures of Jesus in the book of Revelation. Now you can't get them tonight. It's only on Sunday when the media center here is open. I hope you can get these. So we're going to ask the ushers to come. We'll receive the evening tithe and offering. We appreciate your faithfulness in giving to God. And this church depends on each one being faithful. Oh, 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 well, I'm sorry, if you need a debit envelope, the ushers have debit envelopes. If you slip your hands up, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Okay, if anybody needs a debit envelope, and then they'll come back and receive the, the offering. And, and be sure and pray about Freedom Sunday. You know, be sure and pray about Freedom Sunday, what God wants you to do. Uh, we operate on about half the budget of suburban churches our size. And I've mentioned this before, and next time I preach, it's going to be sometime in July, I'm preaching on Sunday. I'm not sure which Sunday yet. And I'm going to mention it on Sunday. Uh, we have an independent auditor come in every year, and they go over our books to make sure everything's done right, and they all say everything's perfect, except the man that works for the company had never done ours before. He'd done other large churches. And he told me, he said, yours is the first large church I've ever done that doesn't have a few people that give a whole lot of money. He said, you don't have one person that gives a whole lot. He says, you have people, average givers. And so this church does depend on each one being faithful. And how many have found out you can't outgive God anyway? Say a big amen. amen. And so you know, you know, he really does give back. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, and adds the true spiritual riches according to Luke 16. He actually says in Luke 16, if I'm not faithful with my finances, he can't give me the true spiritual riches. And read Luke 16 for yourself. And Jesus made that very clear. So we depend on everyone. We have missionaries all over the world. We help support. We we have all these ministries going on in this church, and it takes finances to do it. I know we're in the middle of the city, but how many feel safe when you come in because of all the police officers outside? But just to let you know, that costs us over $100,000 a year because we want people to feel safe when they come. And it's important in this neighborhood. We have to have that. It's not a matter of choice. We've had the same officers for about 25 years, most of them. And so God blesses and and everybody can come in and feel safe. We have great internal security. Brother Chuck Wolf is in charge of our internal security. And we never have any problems. We thank God for that. Thank God for that. It's, uh, he's able to take care of us and he provides the need. But we do, you know, our purpose is to reach as many people in as many ways possible. To get the gospel out here in Kansas City, across the nation, around the world. And that's what we're trying to do. And so we appreciate that. If you're visiting with us, I have the title Pastor Emeritus. That means the old guy on staff. Uh, I've been here for 40 years, but my son's been senior pastor the last seven years. So, you know, God is blessing and pouring his spirit out and, and ministering to people and people are getting saved. That's where the bottom lies, to see people born into the kingdom of God. Father, we're thankful again tonight. We have the opportunity of giving back to you a portion of that that's yours. We know that everything we have, we're just managers. And we know there's coming an accounting day. So I pray that you'll bless each one as we're faithful in giving to you according to your word. The word makes it very clear. The tithe, the first tenth, belongs to you. That's not even ours to decide what to do with. And that goes into the storehouse. So we do pray about what to do in offerings. So I pray that you'll bless your people abundantly. Give back in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Okay, the ushers are coming. And if you didn't get one of the handouts, we probably have a few left. We'll probably be on this another couple or three weeks. And then I'm going to bring a course on how to study the Bible. And uh, the background for that, we're going to use the 23rd Psalm, a version you've never seen before. I'm going to let you take it home. And then we're going to use the principles we learned from that and go through the book of Ephesians verse by verse. And the book of Ephesians uh, has been called by a lot of authors as the crowning work of the Apostle Paul. And it's just absolutely spectacular. It's only six chapters. And we're going to be going through that verse by verse when we get done with what we're doing now. And I don't know how long it will be. It depends on how much discussion we have. Uh, how long we'll be talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so we are in Matthew chapter 24 and 25. Matthew chapter 24 and 25.
There is so much stuff being taught on television and on the internet. Don't believe 99% of what you read on the internet because it's not studied through. Take one or two verses of scripture and build a whole doctrine about it. There are actually some prophecy teachers teaching the Nephilim in Genesis chapter 6 are aliens. Can you believe that? I just heard that this week. I was over at Pastor Fells teaching a prophecy seminar and there were some people there talking about certain people on television are saying the Nephilim, as they're called, the giants. The word translated the giants in your Bible. In Genesis chapter 6, they're trying to claim they're aliens. There is not the slightest itsy-bitsy evidence for that whatsoever, but their own imagination. And uh, so there have been... Whoops, my mic, my mic just... Okay. Uh, there have not been aliens on the earth. And... Uh, you know, it's amazing... Uh, there's a brand new book out, by the way, and it's, uh, it's actually by Lee Strobel. It's called The Case for a Creator. Case for the Creator. And I mentioned that on another Wednesday night, and I tried to buy one three days later in Kansas City, and nobody had any left. So you, a lot of you must have gone out and bought them. But uh, if you have a young person in high school or college, they need to read that book. Uh, uh, if you're not familiar with Lee Strobel, he was an atheist. Uh, he was an evolutionist, and he is a top scholar. And he examines all the scientific evidence for evolution and, and actually not for a creator. He talks to the leading scientists in the world. And he interviews them. And every one of them, without exception, says evolution is a philosophy. There is not the slightest little itsy-bitsy shred of proof for the hypothesis of evolution. And the book scientifically demonstrates why the things in your children's textbooks have been proven scientifically wrong. A lot of them a long time ago. And they're still in the textbooks. Because there's a certain group of people who want to push evolution. Why? Satan is the ruler of the cosmos, the cosmetic, the structured society. And he wants to undermine the word of God. And, uh, you know, you watch a Hollywood movie. Whose name do they take in vain all the time? Yeah, they never say, oh, Muhammad or old Buddha. Okay, they always take Jesus' name in vain. Because there's one name under heaven given among men where he can be saved. And what's that name? Jesus. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father but by me. And when I was preaching on Father's Day at Pastor Horn's church, I know there were some people sitting there, and I said, well, that's not politically correct. You're being intolerant. That's right. I am intolerant because God's intolerant. He says the only way to me is through my son, Jesus Christ. And there's no other way. He's not one of the ways. He is the way to God and the only way. And to prove what he said was true, God raised him from the dead. You can go and find the tomb of Muhammad. You can go and find the tomb of Buddha. But I've been in that little garden tomb in Jerusalem 26 times, and it's still empty, and it's been empty since that first Easter Sunday morning when Jesus came out of the grave. And how many know he's alive because you've met him for yourself? Say a big amen. amen. And so we know he's alive. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. Praise God. It's exciting knowing him. And, uh, so we are in Matthew chapter 24. And just to review some of the things, we are talking about the event called the rapture of the church that a lot of people on television are disagreeing with. And so I wanted to give you some proof on what the scripture really has to say. We've looked at 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5. We looked at, uh, we've, looked at the, uh, we've looked at the promise of the church at Philadelphia where Jesus said, because you've kept the word of my endurance, I will keep you out of that hour which shall come to test all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. And if God keeps you out of the hour, you're not going to be in the hour. He doesn't, say, he doesn't say, I'm going to preserve you from the difficulty. He says, I'm keeping you out of that hour. And he actually uses the Greek word hora that we get our word hour from. And so he says, I'm keeping you out of that time. So if God keeps you out of the time, you're not going to be here. And we've talked about the chronology of the book of Revelation. In the first three chapters of Revelation, the word church or churches is mentioned 21 times. In chapter 4 and 5, the church is in heaven. You hear the great praise. You've redeemed us by your blood. Out of every kindred, tongue, tribe, and nation, made us under our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And the great tribulation, the day of the Lord, begins in Revelation 6.1. And you cannot find the word church in the rest of the book of Revelation. It's not there. Because the church is not here on earth after the end of Revelation chapter 3. And the whole outline makes it very clear. Now, I've been looking at Matthew chapter 24. We also looked at 1 Thessalonians 4. It says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And again, what the Bible teaches is to be absent from the body is to be where if you're a Christian? 
present with the Lord. And that's the soul spirit. The body might go into the ground. It might be eaten by, it might be eaten by crocodiles like one of my missionary friends was. Whatever it is, it's going to decay. It may be in a little box on the counter somewhere. It may be. It may be. But the body's going to decay. But the soul spirit of the Lord. And it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I indicate those that are asleep in Jesus. And again, sleep is idiom for death in the Gentile world in Jesus' day. And in Paul's day, we might say they've expired, they've passed away, they've gone to be with the Lord. In the Gentile world, they said they've gone to sleep. Because the Bible doesn't teach soul sleep at all. I remind you again that Paul says to the Philippians, for your sakes, I'd rather stay here. He was about to be executed by Nero. But he says, as for me, I'm ready to take down this tent and depart and be with Christ. And the Greek text says that's much rather better. So he knew to be absent from the body was to be present with the Lord. But the Bible says, them that sleep in Jesus, the soul spirit will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain are the coming of the Lord shall not precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the cows to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. He goes on to say, but the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord, that's the great tribulation, will come as a thief in the night. When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as to veil upon them with child, and they shall not escape. But you're not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief, you're the children of light. And he says three verses later, God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So the simple chronology means the rapture is going to take place and the day of the Lord is going to begin. And again, the rapture takes place in Revelation 4.1 and the day of the Lord, the great tribulation begins in Revelation 6.1. Now, and then something else we talked about, uh, it was over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The church was being persecuted. Hey, hey, we're not being persecuted here yet. Yet. You ought to go to some of the Muslim countries that I go to. I've told you before, in I, you know, the revolutions going on in Syria right now, both sides are using it as an excuse to murder Christians, both sides. And in Egypt, of course, they kill Coptic Christians all the time, and there's a lot of Coptic Christians in Egypt. And I'm kind of excited about what's going on there today, <laughs> but I, I don't want to get into that. But, uh, I, you know, the church was being persecuted, and someone was going up and saying, brother, I've got a word from the Lord. This is the day of the Lord. And someone else had sent them a letter and signed Paul's name saying, this is the day of the Lord. Meaning they'd missed what? The rapture. So Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brothers, by the coming. And he uses the Greek word that I've already given you, parousia, which is the event for the rapture. And that's when it's used by itself without any modifiers explaining it. I beseech you therefore, brothers, under the parousia, under the coming of the Lord, and by our gathering together unto him, that you stop being shaken mind or troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by a letter supposedly from us that the day of the Lord is here. That's the great tribulation. Because if they were in the great tribulation from what Paul had taught them in 1 Thessalonians, they'd miss the catching away. They'd miss the rapture. Paul said, don't you remember when I was with you? I told you these things. That day, the day of the Lord will not start till the man of sin be revealed and the, and he also mentions the falling away. And that can be translated the apostasy, or as a feminine word, and can be translated the apostate woman. And that may be the great prostitute of Revelation 17, the worldwide religious system. So it says the fact that you don't see the world ruler, the Antichrist, means you haven't missed the catching away. If you see him, you've missed it. If you see him, you've missed it. That day, the day of the Lord, will not come till the man of sin be revealed. 2 Thessalonians 2. He will make a sudden appearance on the scene. And the day of the Lord will not begin till that man makes his appearance. So he's telling them the fact that you don't see him, don't worry about it. You haven't missed the parousia. You haven't missed the rapture. You haven't missed the catching away. And so many of those that think the church has to go through the tribulation. When I teach in Singapore, when I go to Singapore and teach, that's a very popular teaching over there. That the church will, uh, I'm sorry, that the church will go through the tribulation. But their, their whole concept is we're not holy enough. And it's going to take the great tribulation to purify the church. What purifies the church? The blood of Christ, period, exclamation point. The blood of Christ cleanses from every sin. And as I say all the time, and I've said here for 40 years, someone that gets saved today is just as ready for the rapture as Billy Graham because the blood of Jesus Christ makes us ready. 
And 1 Corinthians 15 says, those that are Christ's at his parousia. So if you're a struggling Christian, as long as you're a Christian, you're going to be out of here. If you're battling, as long as you're a Christian, you're going to be out of here. If you fall flat on your face, as long as you're a Christian, you're going to be out of here. That God doesn't give up on us people. Praise God. It's the blood of Christ that makes us ready. It says he will present us holy and unblameable and unreprovable in sight if we continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. That's Colossians chapter 1. So he presents us holy, unblameable, and I translate it unnitpickable in his sight. Have you ever had anybody that nitpicks at you all the time? Well, we, well, well he looks at you in front of the blood of Christ, and he doesn't nitpick at you. People might do it, but God doesn't do it. Aren't you glad he can't see the past? It's under the blood. He can't see it. He can't remember it. I wish I had a forget switch like that, but I don't have one. I don't have one. You know, we battle. How many are still battling? Okay. If you didn't raise your hand, I'll pray for you. That's your second lie. <laughs> okay. Uh, I remember years ago when I first came to Kansas City, there was a, another pastor who instantly decided he didn't like me. And I'd go to a minister's meeting and he'd talk about me publicly. And I never said an unkind word about the man. But I'd get back to the church, a little one in the corner across the street. I'd get down praying and say, God, get him. How many have ever prayed, God, get him? <laughs> yeah. Now, how many of you ever just want to let someone have it? <laughs> yeah. So I'd get down and pray, God, get them. I'd get victory over it, and I'd go to another meeting. He'd do it again. I'd go back, God, you got to get this guy. You got to get him. You got to get him. That went on for about a year. And I'd get victory over it, go back to another meeting. And I thought, I don't need that. I'm not going to the meetings. Well, then Brother Ramphill would call me and say, guess what he said about you today? <laughs> I'd get down again. God, you got to get this guy. And, but when I got to the place that I was honestly praying for him, honestly now, praying for him, not against him, and praying that God would bless the church he pastored and bless his family, that God moved him out of town. <laughs> he was using him as spiritual sandpaper to help me grow up. So if you got someone that rubs you the wrong way, what's God doing? Spiritual sandpaper. He's helping you grow to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So he won't give up on you. But now in Matthew chapter 24, he recalled the apostles asked Jesus three questions. When will Jerusalem be destroyed? Okay. Matthew does not answer that. Matthew does not tell us that. Luke 21 tells us. When you see Jerusalem encompassed with armies, know that the desolation thereof is near. He says, those who are in the countryside don't enter into the city. Those that are in the city get out of it. He goes on to say, for these be the days of vengeance that, that all those things written may take the place. And Jerusalem will, and they will be taken captive and they will... Uh, they will be taken captive and spread all over the world, and Jerusalem will be trodden down to the Gentiles till the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, when you read Revelation chapter 11, the two witnesses indicates at that point there's another three and a half years left in the time of the Gentiles. Because the time, the time of the Gentiles ends with the battle of Armageddon when Jesus comes back as King of kings and Lord of lords. And so we are living in that time of the Gentiles. Now, Matthew doesn't discuss that. And the reason is, Matthew is the gospel to the Jew. And the purpose of the great tribulation is called the time of Jacob's trouble. It's a time when Israel will ultimately receive Jesus Christ as their Messiah. That will take place according to Daniel chapter 12, Revelation chapter 7, Revelation chapter 12. And, and that will take place right at the middle of the seven-year tribulation period. Right at the middle. And let me remind you what Daniel said. He indicated there were 490 years left in Israel's history. And God, God was going to accomplish six different things. This is Daniel chapter 9. From the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince. That commandment is Nehemiah 1 and 2. Unto Messiah the Prince, that's Jesus, would be exactly 483 years. This is the only date set ahead of time in the Bible. And we've talked about it at length. That will be exactly 483 years. After the, and that was fulfilled on Palm Sunday when Jesus publicly announced himself as the Messiah to the capital city, Jerusalem. And then it said, it goes on to say, after that 483 years, a Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself, meaning he died for us. And then the people of the prince that shall come will destroy the city. That took place 40 years later. And then he, the prince that will come, the Antichrist, will make a covenant with Israel for one seven year period. That's still future. So we are right in that gap of time between the first coming of Jesus and his return. And there's a seven-year period left as far as Israel is concerned. And God, uh, uh, 
Uh, he has brought a lot of them back in the land. And like I keep telling you, every Jew doesn't have to go back to Jerusalem. They won't fit. Right? There are more Jews in New York City than Israel. And there's a false teaching on television that every Jew has to go back to Jerusalem. If you read Revelation 12, like I explained it, like it's obvious, uh, uh, the enemy finds out he can't destroy the Jews that are in the Middle East, so he goes to destroy the rest of them around the world. And so we are living at that time when they're looking for a world ruler. Zechariah 12, 13, and 14, which I've asked you to read, indicates in that day Jerusalem will be a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to all the nations of the world. We are right there, right there today. The whole world's focused on Jerusalem. And that's what everything is all about going on in the Middle East. And so Matthew does not describe the destruction of Jerusalem. But he, he is the gospel of the Jews. So the first thing he's described, and we read it last week, is the Great Tribulation period. Because that's going to be the time when Israel accepts Jesus Christ as their Messiah. That's going to be that time. And so he talks about that first in Matthew 24. And then he talks about the climax for the Christian. And uh, lest I leave you thoroughly confused, how many are thoroughly confused already if, if you haven't been here? <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually trying to review. Now, Matthew's gospel is not arranged in chronological order. Uh, Mark and Luke and John are arranged in chronological order. Matthew is arranged by topic. Now, let me explain that the best way. There are two descriptions of the temptation of Jesus in the desert in the Bible. One is Matthew, the other one is Luke. In both stories, the first temptation is turn these stones into bread, okay? In Matthew, the second temptation is, uh, I'm sorry, the second temptation is throw yourself down from the pinnacle of the temple. In Luke, the second temptation is, he showed them all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. He said, all this I'll give you if you'll bow down and worship me. In Luke, the third temptation is, uh, in Luke he says throw yourself down from the pinnacle of the temple and he even quotes the 91st Psalm he'll give his angels charge over you unless you dash your foot in a stone and even the devil can quote the Bible out of context and in Matthew the third temptation he showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and for those of you that weren't here which one's right both yes because Matthew is topical what's the greatest temptation for one born to be king Showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And that's the way Matthew writes his gospel. He reaches toward climaxes of events. And that's what, he's done, that's what he's done in Matthew 24. The climax of the Christian is the rapture of the church. And Luke, of course, is chronological order. How do we know Luke's chronological order? Luke portrays Jesus as the last Adam. Uh, he, <clears throat> so you recall, he traces the family tree all the way back to Adam. And what you have in Luke is Mary's genealogy all the way back to Adam. And Jesus, of course, is the offspring of Mary physically. And in Matthew's gospel, it's a legal succession to the throne of Israel through Joseph. And so uh, he indicates, uh, he goes all the way back to Adam, and he shows that Jesus did not fail where the first Adam failed. Jesus is called the last Adam, not the second Adam, the last Adam. He's called the last Adam. The first one failed. Why? You go to Genesis chapter 3, the woman saw the tree was good for food, the lust of the flesh. What's the first temptation of Jesus? Turn the stones into bread. You've been fasting for 40 days, Jesus. Satisfy. Use your power outside of your Father's will. And then the second temptation of Eve, she saw the tree was pleasant to the eyes. And what, what's the set? And what does Luke say? He showed him all the kingdoms of the world. Everything you see, you can have, Jesus, if you'll bow down and worship me. And the third temptation of Eve, God's an old meanie. He knows you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. You'll be just like God. The third temptation, prove you're the son of God. Throw yourself down from the pinnacle of the temple. And that's the pride of life. And shows that Jesus did not fail where our first parents failed. He is the last Adam. He is the perfect one. He is the, ma he is, uh, he's the man. He's the man. You know, you ask a man, what is a man? They might come up with all kinds of things. Well, maybe during this past few weeks, LeBron James was the man. You know, maybe he's the man. And when I was a kid, it was Gordie Howe that played for the Detroit Red Wings. He's still known as Mr. Hockey. Or Hank Greenberg, who, 50, uh, who hit 58 home runs for the Detroit Tigers when I was a kid. He was one of my heroes. Uh, how about Abraham Lincoln? He ought to be everybody's hero. As a matter of fact, I have one celebrity picture in my office, and that's Dr. Martin Luther King. He ought to be everybody's hero, too. And we could say, he's the man. Or maybe your idea of a man, if somebody says, what's your name? They'll say the name is Bond, James Bond. Maybe that's your idea of a man. <laughs> 
I got news for you. Jesus is the man. Jesus is the man. He's a man's man. He wasn't afraid to cry. Wasn't afraid to cry. He went in and he could play running back for the Chiefs. He went over and overturned the table of the money changers. You, be, you better be a pretty big dude to do that. He wasn't a little puny guy like some of the artists paint him. He worked with his hands and uh, uh, not only in the carpentry shop, wood was so expensive they didn't have a lot of wood. He was probably more likely a stonemason, make tables and chairs out of stone rather than wood because the average person couldn't afford wood in that part of the world. So he was a man's man. He could cause 12 strong men to leave everything behind and go follow him. Only a man can do that. Jesus was not a wimp. I got news for you, gentlemen. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, be a man. Don't be a wimp, be a man. I want you to say, God hasn't called me to be a wimp. All the men say that. Come on. Called you to be a wimp. Called you to be a man. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Okay. I got that out of my system now. Well, I preached that over at Pastor Fells on Father's Day. <laughs> Now, so Matthew 25, we've already talked about the last days, and he talks about that first. And let me reiterate, uh, uh, all the way down to verse 29, he says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth shall mourn when they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That's the battle of Armageddon. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. They shall gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. How'd they get to heaven? The rapture. Now, learn the parable of the fig tree. And I pointed out last week the fig tree is the city of Jerusalem, not the state of Israel. And then he says, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. I pointed out last week the usual meaning of the Greek word genos, genus, is race. And all Jesus is simply saying is the Jewish race will not cease to exist till all these things come to pass. And that's the basic meaning of the word. If you're visiting, I taught New Testament Greek for 25 years. And the basic meaning of the word is this race of people will not cease to exist till all these things be fulfilled. As the days of Noah were, so shall the parousia, that's the word used for the rapture, translated coming, so shall the Son of Man be. In the days that were before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage, business as usual. Didn't know till the flood came and took them all away. There's not going to be any more warning than what we have in this book that the rapture of the church can take place. The, there's only two events in the Bible. I've already mentioned this that happen as a thief in the night. One is, uh, uh, it's actually mentioned in 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 and 2 Peter 2, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. That's the great tribulation period. And we're going to see in Matthew 24 something else that happens as a thief in the night. Right, as a thief in the night. Those are the only two things. The battle of Armageddon, they're going to know the very day because the armies will be gathered there to make war against him when he comes back. That's Revelation chapter 19. They're gathered to make war against Jesus Christ when he comes back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. If the tribulation would take place, uh, I'm sorry, if the rapture would take place in the middle of the tribulation, they'd know the exact day. It will be exactly three and a half years after the world leader signs a covenant with Israel. And the book of Daniel says there will be a seven-year covenant. In the midst of the seven years, he will cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. That's the temple in Jerusalem. So the temple must be built by the middle of the tribulation period, not before the rapture of the church. And again, the chronology of the book of Revelation shows the rapture takes place before any of these things happen. You know what that means? It could take place before you get home tonight. It could take place before tomorrow. But you can't set a date. Jesus said it's not for you to know. What does that mean? It's not for you to know. When the obvious sense makes the best sense, any other sense is nonsense. So just believe what it says. It's not for you to know. Now, as the days that were before, they knew not till the flood came and took them all away, so shall the parousia, the coming of the Son of Man, be. Then, meaning at that time, two will be in the bed, one taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, one taken, the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord does come. No, this is the owner of the house would have known in what watch the thief would come. He would have suffered, not allowed his house to be broken up. Be you therefore ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. Who is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord has made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Happy is that servant whom his Lord, when he comes, shall find so doing. Truly I say unto you, I shall make him ruler over all his goods. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delays his coming, and begin to smite his fellow servants, and need drink with the drunken, 
The Lord of that servant will come on a day when he looks not for him in an hour he's not aware of, cut him asunder, appoint him his portion with the hypocrites, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now that's the only other event that happens as a thief in the night. Two in the bed, one taken, the other left. Two grinding at the mill, one taken, the other left. Without warning, the rapture is going to take place. And again, the battle of Armageddon, they're going to know the very day it's going to happen. Yes, uh-huh. Uh, hold the mic up. In Hebrews um, 6, 4, it says it's impossible to bring those back who have fallen away. Uh, we'll get back to that. Uh, uh, let me wait on that. Okay, let me wait on that till we get to chapter 25. Okay. Now, so the rapture is going to take place without warning. Got a question? Yes, going back to uh, Genesis chapter 3, uh -huh. where God said, don't eat of the fruit. Uh -huh. Well, later when uh, Satan is talking to Eve, she says, God said, thou shalt not eat of it or touch it. Okay, we don't have everything it's, God told them. We just have certain things. I just, I just didn't know if there was a, 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 big, a big significance in that. No, no, no. Oh, no, no. She, just, uh, she didn't lie. We just don't have everything God told Adam and Eve because they, uh, they walked with him in the cool of the day, so who knows what all he told them. Okay. Yeah. I don't know, she didn't sin until she ate. Okay, if God says don't, what does that mean? Don't. Don't. It means don't. Dr. Westlake. Yes. How do we know um, when the promise is to us and when the promise is to the Israelites? Carefully reading the context. Carefully reading the context. There's a lot of promises to Israel that are not for the church. Uh, there's a lot of promises for everybody, ultimately, because when God restores Israel, the church is involved in the future events, in the, uh, in the books of Ezekiel, the latter chapters of Isaiah. Those things are going to be when Jesus is ruling here on earth. And so those things are for the church and Israel. But God, is, God does have certain promises to Israel. He did promise in the latter days he would bring them back into the Lamb. He did promise in the latter days the language of the old city of Jerusalem would be a pure lip, meaning Hebrew. It hasn't been a pure lip since 586 B.C. until the Six-Day War. And then once again, Hebrew is the official language on the streets of the old city of Jerusalem. And, and so he has given promises. Number one, the main promises God has given Israel are the coming of the Messiah. Uh, many of you know Jesus fulfilled 333 prophecies of the Old Testament. And that's one of the things, before Muhammad or Buddha were born or anybody else, you never heard of them. They were expecting the Messiah. And my friends in Israel, it's, I know they're still looking for their Messiah. I said, well, I'm looking for the same person, but I've already met him. <laughs> because he's coming. Uh, he's coming. And he's going to set up his kingdom. And he is the Messiah of Israel, the seed of the woman. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. It says, unto us a child is born, a son is given. God, this, God has always existed as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. At a point in time, the Son was given, but born as a child. Isaiah 9 says, Unto us a child is born, and a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And he will sit upon the throne of David to establish it with judgment and justice from now on, even forever. Now, that's a promise to Israel, but also a promise to us. Jesus Christ is going to rule. But you have to read the context really closely. Okay, any other questions here? And I'll get back to that one you asked. Okay, any other questions? So there's going to be a rapture. Now there's a couple words. Those that say the church is going through the tribulation. And what they say, it's the middle of the tribulation and you're a Christian and you're married to somebody that's not and he's going to come and take you out and leave her here. Okay? Two in the bed, one taken, the other left. And here's their argument. Let me give you their argument. Matthew uh, in Matthew chapter 24, I mentioned in verse 38 again, as the days of Noah were before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, knew not till the flood came and took them all away. And then now, what did it take them away to? Judgment. Okay, days that were before the flood took them all away to judgment. They died. Okay, the flood came and took them all away. And the next verse says, so shall the parousia, the coming of the Son of Man, be. Two shall be in the field, one taken, the other left. And, they, and their argument is this. George, how can you say in one verse, the flood came and took them all away, and then the next verse take the same phrase, took them all away, meaning it took them to heaven. Do you understand their logic there? Okay, what's the difference? It uses two different Greek words. 
Okay, well, when it says the flood came and took them all away, it uses the Greek verb airo, A-I-R-O. And I think I have a place on your paper if you want to write that down. A-I-R-O, airo. Airo is used in John 15. In John chapter 15, it says, I am the vine, you are the branches. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that's not bearing fruit, he takes away. And every branch in me that's bearing fruit, he prunes it so it may bring forth more fruit. And the word translated take away there is airo. Every branch in me that's not bearing fruit, he takes away. And every branch that's bearing fruit, he prunes it so it may bring forth more fruit. He goes on to say, now, now you're clean through the word that I've spoken to you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it keep remaining in the vine, no more can you unless you keep remaining in me. If a man does not keep remaining in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they're burned, remain in me. And the word I wrote is, and that's the one translated there, taken away. However, when he says two in the bed, one taken, the other left, let me give you a long Greek word. It's paralambano. I'll spell it for you. P-A-R-A-L-A-M-B-A-N-O. Paralambano. And every beginning Greek student can tell you that word means to be received alongside of. And it's used in John 14. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and paralambano you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. The problem is in our English translation, not in the original text. And so we'll be received alongside of. And then I heard someone say on television... Well, Luke says there's going to be two in the bed and one taken and the other left. And the word one means male. Two means males. So it means homosexuals. Doesn't mean anything of the kind. <laughs> Greek is an Indo-European language. Anybody here know French? Anybody at all? Okay, when you speak French, if you have mixed company, you use masculine pronouns, don't you? If you have mixed company. If you have male and female, you have masculine modifiers. And so... I, and then Greek's the same way. You can have a hundred women and one man, but it's mixed company, so it'll use masculine modifiers. So, so now it's going to say one. It'll use the masculine form of one because Greek has masculine and feminine neuter. And the same with French. It has masculine and feminine. And it's a... And any time it's a mixed company, it uses masculine. That's, that, that's why the Bible frequently says men when it means men and women. It means men. And usual Greek word is anthropos, where we get our word anthropology from. That's the Greek word translated man. Unless he's making a distinction, then he uses the Greek word aner, that means men as opposed to women. And when it says, when it says Jesus fed 5,000 men, it means aner. It uses aner, meaning there were 5,000 males there beside women and children when he broke the five loaves and two fishes. And so, it, uh, there's all kinds of stuff pulled out of context. You've got to look at the whole story. got to look at the whole story. So there's going to be a rapture of the church. Now let's look at Matthew 25. Any more questions before I go on here? Because I've, I've covered a lot of material quick here because we've been talking about it for weeks. Okay, and I will do a review of it in a couple of weeks. Now, Matthew 25. Then, what does the word then mean at that time? At that time when what? When he comes as a thief. Then the kingdom shall be likened unto ten virgins. Paul tells the church, I have espoused you or engaged you as a pure virgin to Jesus Christ. In Ephesians 1, it says, after you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance till the redemption of the purchased possession. That's Ephesians 1.14. The earnest. The Greek word arabona, translated earnest, in modern Greek means engagement ring. I don't think that's an accident. And when you get saved, you get the engagement ring. There's going to be a wedding feast one of these days. All right? So, eventually the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. And now, he didn't say they were professed virgins. He said they were virgins. And are, do you realize that you are as pure before Jesus Christ as a virgin in every way possible? By the blood of Jesus Christ. God doesn't look down at Dale and say, now, Dale, I know you're a rotten sinner, but I've covered you with the blood, and I know I've forgiven you. He looks down at Dale and says, Dale's never sinned. That's what the blood of Jesus Christ does. That's what it means to be justified, to be declared not guilty of ever having sinned. Turn to the person next to you and say, you're not guilty before God. <laughs> now, how many times does the devil try to make you think you are? <laughs> 
Yeah, he's the accuser. Look what you did 14 years ago. Ooh, look what you did yesterday. Ah, look what you did two hours ago. The devil's good at that. The only one who remembers your past sins are you and your friends and the devil. God's forgotten all about them. Like in the ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five were wise, five were foolish. Those that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. The bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. At midnight there was a cry made, behold the bridegroom comes, go out to meet him. All those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps and the foolish said unto the wise, now literal translation says, give us of your oil for our lamps are going out. Now the oil is always a picture of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. All right, he's none of his. Now, he doesn't say they were professed virgins. Their lamps were going out. At the time the cry was going out, behold, the bridegroom comes, their lamps were going out. So they knew they would be gone out by the time he got there. And the foolish said, the wise answered, not so, lest there be not enough for us, but go rather than that sell and buy for yourselves. While they went to buy, the bridegroom came. I heard one television preacher, it's a good comment. <laughs> uh, he also said the bridegroom's the one that sells the oil, so it's too late. <laughs> And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said to them, I don't know you. Now, he doesn't say, I never knew you. He says to the group in Matthew 7, I never knew you. But he didn't say, here, I never knew you. He said, I don't know you. Why? Why? The Bible makes it clear that God is able to keep us. How many believe that? Paul said, I know whom I believe and I'm persuaded he's able to keep my, uh, he's able to keep my deposit against that day. Jude says unto him that's able to keep you and present you faultless before the throne of his glory with exceeding great joy to the only wise God our Savior be power and glory both now and forever. Jesus said, my father that gave you to me is mightier than all and no man can pluck you out of my father's hand. But you see, theologians have trouble with paradoxes. Because on the other hand, we have warning after warning after warning after warning in both the Old and New Testament that it's possible to walk away from God. You don't lose your salvation. Now, the number one question in 24 years was called, called, can I lose my salvation? Like you're walking along, oops, no, 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 no. But you can deliberately walk away. Why are all these warnings in the Bible if it can't happen? One author actually said these things are in the Bible in case it can happen, but it can't happen. Well, then why did God put it in here? Uh, he read the parable of the uh, oh, what is it, the sower who went out and sowed seed Jesus himself said some of the seed grows for a while and the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things choke it out and it dies uh, there's others that have no depth in themselves and the fowl of the air come down and devour the seed and it's gone I've already called Colossians 1 he will present us holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight if we continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. He's writing to Christians. And you can go over and over and over a lot of passages. Just turn to 1 Corinthians. I think this will answer the question that you asked me earlier. Uh, 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 or go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And actually, the chapter division should be at the end of verse 23 of chapter 9. Don't forget the chapter divisions and verses were added in the Middle Ages. And they got this one in the wrong place. Starting with verse 24. Don't you know that they which run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? And how many get the gold medal in the race? One. In their day, it was a laurel wreath. Keep running that you might obtain. Every man that strives for the games is self-controlled in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we are an incorruptible. Therefore I keep running, not as uncertainly. So I keep fighting, not as one that beats the air, but I bring my body into subjection, lest by any means when I've announced the rules to others, I myself should be disqualified. And the Greek word translated in your King James Bible, cast away or disqualified, is adakimos, is translated everywhere else in the Bible, reprobate. Totally disapproved. And if you read this without a preconceived theological theory, Paul is saying he can be disqualified for heaven. And then he goes on to explain it. Moreover, brothers, I don't want you should be ignorant 
How that all our fathers were under the cloud, they all passed through the sea, they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea, they did all eat the same spiritual meat. He goes on to say they did, and they did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, but with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the desert. Now these things were examples to the intent that we, now he's writing to Christians, we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. That's from Numbers chapter 11. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them, as it's written, the people sat down to eat, drink, and rose up to play. That's Exodus 32. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them, uh, uh, I'm sorry, as some of them committed and fell in one day 23,000. That's Numbers 25. Neither let us test Christ as some of them also tested were destroyed of serpents. That's Numbers 21. Neither murmur as some of them murmured. That's Numbers 16 and Numbers 14. And were destroyed to destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for examples. They are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the age are come. Therefore let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. There is no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able but will with the temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Now go over to, uh, go over to the book of Hebrews. I've already quoted Colossians. Go over to the book of Hebrews. And I have a course already at master's level on Hebrews. I was going to teach in Singapore, but when I got ready to teach it, that's when Gene had to go to the hospital last time. I've never used my master's level course on Hebrews. And if I taught it here, it would take forever because I have 45 hours of classroom time when I teach it. Now, okay, look at Hebrews, first of all, chapter 2. Now, again, the Bible emphasizes the security of the believer. You don't have to walk around, I might backslide, I might backslide, I might backslide. Okay, that's a, that's a lie of the enemy. But to say you can't is denying too much of the word of God. Too much. Okay, let's read chapter 2. Holy brothers, sharers of the heavenly calling. Now, that's what he calls them. Holy brothers, sharers of the heavenly calling. I'll go down to verse 7. Uh-huh. What did I say? 2 is chapter 3. I'm sorry. Okay, okay, yeah, chapter 3 is what I'm reading. I'm sorry, 3 1. Holy brothers, sharers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ. Now, in verse 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you will hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as in the provocation, the day of testing in the desert, where your fathers tested me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. I was disgusted with that generation and said in my heart, they do always wander away in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath they will not enter into my rest. That was going into Canaan. Take heed, brothers. Who does he call? Brothers. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in apostatizing from the living God. That's the Greek text, the word apostasy. And he calls them holy brothers. Apostate is someone that no longer believes Jesus is the way of salvation. So he not only warns about walking away, he warns you to become an apostate. I have met apostates. I have met those that no longer believe Jesus is the way of salvation, even though God had changed their lives. Say, so how could anyone do that? How did Judas do it? He walked with them three and a half years. How did Saul, the king of Israel, do it? He was turned into another man by the Holy Spirit. He prophesied among the prophets. And yet it says the Lord departed from him and became his enemy. Why? Because Saul departed from the Lord first. Now let's keep reading. Uh, this argument goes all the way down through verse, uh, it all uh, it goes all the way down to verse 9 of the next chapter. And actually all, all the way down to verse 11. Let us therefore labor to enter into that lest, lest any man fail after the same manner of unbelief. He's writing to Christians. Now I skip chapter 2. In verse 1. Therefore it is necessary to pay attention to the things which we have heard lest at any time we should drift away from them. He's not talking y'all unsaved, he's talking about us and <laughs> we -ins. We have heard, lest at any times we let them slip, and the word is used of a boat drifting away from the dock. Also used in, uh, it's also used in Greek literature of a ring slinging off the finger and being lost. 
lest any time we drift away from there. For the word spoken by angels, that's the Sinai covenant, was steadfast. And every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense and reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? And he's writing to Christians. Look at chapter 6. This was the question our sister raised here. Chapter 6. It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made sharers of the Holy Spirit. You're not a sharer of the Holy Spirit until you're saved. And have tasted the word of God, good. And the powers of the world to come, good. And fell away. Fell away. And such a notable scholar, A.T. Robertson, who was for 25 years president of the Southern Baptist Convention, has a series of books called, uh, it's actually called Word Pictures in the Greek New Testament. And, the, and those of us that have taught Greek consider A.T. Robertson the professor. He wrote a grammar book that's that big and that thick on Greek. And he makes the statement, these are written as actual, not hypothetical experiences. Actual, not hypothetical experiences. And if you want a good set of books, A.T. Robertson, Word Pictures in the Greek New Testament, he uses English letters to spell the Greek word, so anybody can use the set. And I like that set so well, I bought it for my grandsons and my son and my son-in-laws. Uh, it's actually that good a set. Now you can get it on a DVD and put it on your computer. Pastor, over here. Where, where? Right here. <laughs> uh, I was reading um, in John 10, and it said, my sheep hear my voice, right. and I know them, and they, will, and they follow me. Right. And I give them eternal life, and, they, will and never, they shall never perish. That's right. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hands. That's right. My Father which gave, gave them to me is greater than, than us all. So when do we get eternal life? Do we receive eternal life once we accept Christ? Eternal, or do we life, we, uh, eternal life, John 15, keep remaining in me. If a man does not keep remaining, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the resurrection and the life. As long as I'm remaining in him, I'm part of eternal life. But he says, if a man does not keep remaining in me, he is cast forth of the branch and is withered. And men gather them, cast them into the fire, and they're burned. That's John 15. Okay, Jesus said it shall never perish. So right. why would he say it shall never? Because never means like abiding, impossible. As long as they're abiding in him, I know, as long as we're abiding in him, we're one of his sheep. If we walk away, we're no longer one of his sheep. Look at all these other scriptures. You can't explain them away. You see, that's part of the problem. We don't like paradoxes. <laughs> we don't like paradoxes. To me, the Bible emphasizes the security of the believer, but it gives warning you can walk away. Yes, sir. Okay. Here's, a, here's another verse that, that I would uh, like to share with you, kind of related to what the gentleman just spoke uh -huh. there in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh -huh. verse number 19 and 20. It says, what? Know ye not that your body is a temple, temple of the Holy right. Ghost, but ye have a God, and you are not your own, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. And so, for me, that, that, that verse tells me that I've been bought by the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not my own. To me, that verse says that I'm, in a way, I'm a slave because he paid the price for my salvation. Right. At what but, I mean, at what point can I give my salvation? He's, okay. and, and, he, and, and, and this gentleman said, he said, I'll okay. never leave you or forsake you. Okay. And I will in no wise cast you out. Well, I will no wise cast you out, but you walk away. He didn't cast Saul out. Saul walked away. Let me finish. Okay. But I'm not my own. All right, let's read the rest of the verses you quoted. I don't you know that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? God forbid. Don't you know that he that's joined to a prostitute is one body, for two shall be one flesh. He that's joined to the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every man that, he goes on to say, every man that, I'm sorry, every sin that a man does is outside the body. He that commits fornication sins against his own body. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have God, you are not your own. You're bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body, your spirit, which are God. He doesn't say you can't walk away. You still have a free will. He doesn't make you a robot. Now, the way I draw the picture is a man walking the up. He's actually walking on the outside of a mountain. And there's a three-foot wall there. He's not going to fall off. But if he makes up his mind he wants to jump, he can. And Judas was among the 12 when Jesus said, you will sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Judas was among the 12 when he said that. He didn't say 11 of you. But what happened? Judas 
walked away. In the same way with Saul, the king of Israel in the Old Testament. It's one book, he walked away. And you have all these warnings. What are the warnings for if it can't happen? He warns us and warns us. Look at, for, uh, look at Hebrews chapter... Well, let's finish this one first. We didn't finish this one. Now, again, the Bible emphasizes security. But you've got to look at the other side of the picture. Uh, another thing is people say, well, well, how can God be sovereign and give you a free will? But the Bible teaches both. God is absolutely sovereign, but he makes it clear we have a free will. If we, I know one of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. We have a free will. Oh, yeah, Demas walked away. Paul said, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. And let me, uh, 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 let me finish this passage first. Okay, Hebrews chapter 6. Whoops, I got Corinthians open. Hebrews chapter 6. He, again, the problem is we have trouble with paradoxes. We can't see how we can be saved by grace and yet be able to walk away. But... but, but I, the Bible's full of paradoxes, the sovereignty of God, and yet we have a free will. And the Bible makes it clear God's not willing that one soul should perish, and yet people are going to perish. So everything doesn't happen according to the will of God. That's why we're to pray, uh, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, uh, let's go back to Hebrews 6. It's impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made sharers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the word of God good, and the powers of the world to come good, and fell away, is what the Greek text says. It's impossible to renew them again under repentance, seeing they keep on crucifying to themselves the Son of God afresh, and keep on putting him to an open shame. Now this is the apostate, not the backslider. An apostate is someone that no longer believes Jesus is the way of salvation. And these people have come to the point where they say that's not the way of salvation. We're depending on something else. They fell away from Jesus. And Paul says the Galatians in chapter 5, uh, uh, let me remind you about the Galatian churches. They had been saved in Paul and Barnabas' missionary trip. And right away the Judaizers came along. They established churches at Iconia, Lister, Derbe, and Antioch of Pisidia. And immediately the Judaizers came along and said, now you've got to keep the Old Testament law. And Paul calls them basically Galatian dummies. He uses the same word that Socrates used to call the students stupid. And he actually says, he actually says, how are you saved? By the keeping of the law, by the hearing of faith. And he gives those seven arguments to show the Christian is not under the Sinai covenant, that you don't have to keep certain laws and certain rules and certain regulations and certain days and certain feast days. And he says, that's a heteros, that's a false gospel. But he also says, you that are made complete by the law, you're fallen from grace. That's right in Galatians. You're fallen from grace. And uh, let me finish this here first, okay? Uh, again, this is the... Uh, uh, he, indicates, uh, he indicates this is the apostate because those that crucified him denied he's the son of God. Okay, go ahead. What's your question? Okay, I'm trying to witness to my sister and I'm wondering, am I, you know, am I battling a dead horse or what? Because she used to really, really believe, and now she's like, whoa. I mean, it freaks me out. <laughs> well, it might be the way she's living, but does she deny that Jesus is the way to God? Well, when I talk to her, she believes that, you know, she believed. I got her to renounce some scripture and stuff back know. to me, at least. But well, she's not in the but apostate. She's living. She's but she's living a totally different life than... Oh, she liked the prodigal son. The prodigal son started out at home. Started out at home. When he came back, the father said, this my son was dead and is alive so again. So my question is, how far can someone fall away? And I, how many years can I don't someone know. fall away before it's no longer you can bring them back? We can always bring them back until they become an apostate and no longer believe Jesus is the way of salvation. They can always come back can always come back. Because it's like the Bible says the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy, and deceive. Man, he's deceived her. Right. Well, I I mean, just keep praying for her that God will break through. That's all you can do. Just keep praying for her that God will break through. I've seen him break through on hard cases. How many have seen him break through on hard cases? How many of you were hard cases? <laughs> We've got a church full of hard cases here. <laughs> you know, I was telling someone today, they said, we had someone come into our church that's an ex-thief. I said, you ought to come to Sheffield. <laughs> as, a, as a matter of fact, someone's you know, someone told me today, they said, boy, I've got someone I need to call, but they're, 
well, they're bad people. I said, I know a bunch of bad people who will handle them for you. <laughs> so, don't, <laughs> so don't worry about them. I don't know if you're aware that Steve St. John in the church, had, and he doesn't mind us telling us, when he was arrested, they sent 23 FBI agents after him. One man, they sent 23 FBI agents. And he's here every service. He came back years ago and got saved. He was in the federal pen for 10 years. And here about a year ago, he made a bad turn and some young policemen stopped him and they called for backup. And, and the older policeman came out, two or three squad cars, and they got out of the car. I said, oh, that's Steve. He's a Christian now. Leave him alone. <laughs> I have a question over here. Over Hi. here. <laughs> What's the difference between apostate, the word you just used? Apostate no longer believes Jesus is the way of salvation. Then what's a reprobate mind? A reprobate mind is no longer able to distinguish right from wrong. Okay. Yeah, it's used in Romans 1. Because they did not like to retain God in their thinking, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things that are unnatural. And he uses it a whole list of sins in Romans chapter 1. Okay, let's look at another passage in Hebrews. I hate Sir, it. could an apostate not change his mind after he... Uh, it's very doubtful. Yeah, it's doubtful, but he could, could he not? Uh, as long as he's no longer an apostate, he can. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, as long as he's no longer an apostate, he's no longer an apostate. If he says, oh yeah, Jesus is the way. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be in his shoes. <laughs> it, uh, uh, Dr. Westlake? Yes. Right here. Okay. Hi. We had to have a little light, blue light that goes off, like Kmart or something. Uh -huh. um, I've got a question for you. Uh, you know, we talk, you're talking about the apostate mind. And um, when they talk about the only sin that's unforgivable, can you make the... The, uh, the connection only between sin those is two? blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Right. So can you kind of talk about a connection between those two? Uh, there isn't any. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, you have to leave it in the context. I've heard all kinds of explanations. It's in Matthew 12. The context determines the meaning of a word. Okay, let me say that with me. Context determines the meaning. Uh, An illustration I used, if I say tree, I don't mean trunk. If I say trunk, what do you think of? Trunk, what do you think of? Okay, 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 you think of a car trunk, a tree trunk, an elephant trunk? Okay, what determines the meaning of the word trunk, the other words around it? The Bible's no different. It means what it means in that sentence, in that paragraph, in that book. And you can't pull it out and make it mean something else. You have to leave it where it is and what it's talking about. And so, uh, Pastor, one more question right here. Okay. Sorry. The, the reprobate mind, I noticed Jesus uh, would say, you scribes and Pharisees and teachers of the laws, but he wouldn't mention the Sadducees. Would that be an example of a reprobate or a, an apostate? No, the Sadducees just didn't believe anything anyway. I mean, the Apostle Paul was a, Phar was a Pharisee, right? He was a Pharisee, okay. but an apostate is someone that no longer believes what they used to believe. The word means to stand off from. So they no longer believe what they used to believe. So it has to be someone that believed and walked away and no longer believes the truth. And that's the big difference. A backslider is just someone that knows they're away from God. They know Jesus is the way and they intend someday to come back. They better not wait too long. It's like the prodigal son. I'll go back to my father and home. And again, he said, this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So uh, what was I talking about before? <laughs> Here. Oh, bless me of the Holy Spirit. The context determines what it means. The context is this. The Pharisees saw Jesus casting demons out by the power of the Holy Spirit in order to protect their own religious authority and their position. They deliberately attributed the work of the Holy Spirit to the devil when they knew better. So it can't be done ignorantly. And that's the only thing it means. So I'm a religious leader and I see him casting out demons by the Spirit of God and I know better, but I decided he's going to influence, he's going to take my authority from me. So I'm going, to, I'm going to say what he's doing is of the devil. That's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That's the only thing it is. You have to leave it in the context where it's found. You can't pull it out and make it mean ten other things. And that's what people do with Scripture. You can't do that. It means what it means in that paragraph, in that sentence, in that book. So you have to leave it there. Pastor. Oh, well, let me say, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is not something you can commit in ignorance. You have to know what you're doing. I have pastor friends that, that actually were taught that speaking in other tongues is of the devil. 
But they were taught that and they didn't know any better. And a lot of them have been filled with the Holy Spirit now speaking other tongues. Uh, it's amazing when I go to Africa or I go to Muslim countries, every single missionary I talk to believes that they have to pray in the Spirit. And every one of them do. And I say, but your denomination at home doesn't believe that. They said, they're not out on the front line. I am. And they say, I need all the power I can get. And, and so, it, uh, but I know my friends that said it was the devil, they were taught that. But, but you have to know what you're doing to commit blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. You have to know it. Okay, so basically, the person is knowledgeable that the it's God miracle it. or whatever it happened right. was from the Holy Spirit, from and they just outright lied. Outright lie, and to protect their own position. Okay. Um, well, I mean, yeah. whatever. Yeah, you have to be a religious leader to do it. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, Pastor, I'll just here. read yep. uh, out of Philippians. Yeah. Uh -huh. And it was saying in uh, chapter 1, 6, verse 6, uh -huh. being confident of this very thing, that which is he, he, which, well, which well, is he the has begun a good, good work, work you, will keep you, on performing until it until the day, day of, of Jesus. Absolutely, absolutely, he will. But that doesn't take away your free will. All right, it doesn't take it away. You've got to take the other verses too. I'll, 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 and you can't take this batch and ignore this batch. And again, we have trouble with paradoxes. What, the, the emphasis in the New Testament is the security of the believer. But Jesus himself gives warnings. Was, was not Julius the Scarlet was called the son of addition? Pardon? Was not Julius the Scarlet called the son of addition? Yeah, but not till after, uh, because he was going to sin, because Jesus had foreknowledge. But, but, but he still said, you will sit on 12 thrones. You know, it was two people in the Bible that's called the son of addition, the Antichrist and Julius the Scarlet. Well, I know. I'm aware of that. I'm aware of that. And the word perdition means destruction. Pass. Here. Uh -huh. I, uh, Hebrews. Uh -huh. It's an interesting book. I've heard no one knows who the true author is. But I, I understand it was written to the Jews. And one of the things that I've heard is that uh, this falling back is that there were, there were Jews that believed in Christ. And they, and they believed he was the Messiah. But, they would, but then they would go back to the law. And they, they, they would believe in the law. And so they... They were flip-flopping back and forth but you know, that's between an the argument. law but, but you and, know and that's... But you know why people say that? It's an argument while well, the book of Hebrews is only written to Jewish Christians. No. Only Jewish Christians can do that. No. Now, if only Jewish Christians, we can do it too. Right. So, yeah, I've read all the arguments. I know F.F. F. Bruce is one of the leading scholars in the world today. I think he's Presbyterian, isn't he? F.F. F. Bruce, anybody know? I know Alan's not here. He would know. And he is a very ultra, uh, ultra almost Calvinistic interpreter and he makes a statement. It's his textbook I use for my students. And he makes a statement. He says these warnings have to mean what they say. You can't explain them away. And you've got to take it, to, I have to take it at face value. And a lot of people don't have, now again, I emphasize the security of the belief. I preach in all different kinds of churches. I preach in a Methodist church in Singapore, one of the oldest churches in, uh, in Asia. I've preached in Baptist churches and Presbyterian churches and Episcopalian churches. And I don't get into the issues we disagree on. Again, the things we agree on. But unconditional eternal security started with Augustine. And Augustine also believed in predestination. You don't have a choice. And that's where it came from. I, 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 you know, until Augustine came along about, uh, about 350 AD, the church didn't believe in predestination. They didn't believe in unconditional security. They believed Jesus was coming back. And uh, he stopped believing in prophecy. And we convert the world. Then Jesus can come back. And the church bought into all this stuff. But uh, let me read a couple more passages here. But, but again, the Bible emphasizes the security. We're not on some kind of a slippery tightrope. Okay? But we can walk away. God never takes away our free will. He doesn't make us robots. And uh, that's what the father said. This my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost. His and he tells the Galatians, you've fallen from grace. And I've seen that tried to be explained away in every possible way. Now, uh, look, at, uh, uh, look at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. I will start with verse 26. If we keep on practicing willful sin, now all sin's willful. It's not like, whoops, I fell into a sin. Okay, we exercise our will to sin. Okay, we exercise our will to sin. Okay, if we keep practicing willful sin, after we've received the knowledge of the truth. Now, let me, uh, uh, those of you that don't attend here regularly, let me give you two Greek words. Say gnosis. 
almost heard you. Say gnosis. Okay, it's G-N-O-S-I-S. That means knowledge. Okay, now say epinosis. That's also translated knowledge. What's the difference? Two plus two is four. That's gnosis. But if I go one, two, plus one, two, equals one, two, three, four, that's epinosis. I've experienced it. In the New Testament, there is no such thing as false epinosis. It means you really know God. There's no such thing as false epinosis in the New Testament. And this is the word he uses here, epinosis. Epinosis. It, it, I actually said that we keep on practicing willful sin. Now that's the practice of sin, not a one-time sin. After we have received the epinosis of the truth, not head knowledge, experimental knowledge, there remains no longer, a little Greek word, ukethi, that means no longer a sacrifice for sins. What does remain? A certain fearful looking for a judgment and fire indignation that shall devour the adversary. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God, has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and done despite to the spirit of grace. We know him that said, Vengeance belongs to me. I will recompense, says the Lord. Again, the Lord will judge his people. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Amen. Now, that's as plain as it can be. It doesn't say just Jewish Christians. He warns us. Now, we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. Uh, we know Paul didn't write it. That's the only thing we know for sure. It's not Paul's Greek. And the only reason it says Paul, uh, uh, the only reason it says the epistle of Paul to the Hebrews is there was a man by the name of Clement of Alexandria. And some of the church leaders were challenging the book of Hebrews because they didn't like some of the things it said. So in order to protect it, Clement listed it under the epistles of Paul. And that's how, that's how it came to be known as either the epistle of Paul to the Hebrews. Some of the early church writers thought it was Priscilla. That's why there's no name on it. And wouldn't that be interesting, ladies? <laughs> okay. Uh, Priscilla wrote the book of Hebrews. Uh, you know, uh, uh, she and her husband are mentioned four times, and sometimes when it mentions teaching, she's mentioned first. What does that mean? She was the primary teacher. And I know a lot of men don't like that, but that's what it says. I, I, I just keep reading this now. Counted the blood of the covenant way with he sanctified an unholy thing. And then despite to the spirit of grace. Let me give you one more verse of scripture where epinosis is used. And by the way, the NIV, for instance, is the most theological interpretive translation in the history of the English language. But even, a, you know, in 1 Corinthians 13, they make a distinction between gnosis and epinosis. Uh, it says, now we have knowledge, but then we will have perfect knowledge. And that's the only place they translate epinosis accurately because they don't want to disagree with the teaching of unconditional security. <laughs> you know, let's read 1 Peter. I'm sorry, 2 Peter. Uh, he's, uh, he's talking about false teachers. And notice verse 20. If after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, now he goes on to say, through the epinosis of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse than the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness, and after they've known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. It's happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog has turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the fire. You have all these warnings. And God doesn't say this just to waste his breath. Now again, the emphasis is God's able to keep us. You don't have to backslide. You don't have to walk away from God. And if you're struggling, that blood, you know, First John says this, my little children, these things are right unto you that you don't sin. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And you read the previous verses, if we are walking in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, keeps on cleansing us from every sin. We're walking under the shower of the blood of Christ. But, then, but, but that's the main emphasis. But you still have these warnings all the way through. You can't ignore them like they're not there or try to explain them away because we have trouble with paradoxes. Now, there are some people you say, no, God's sovereign, therefore he has to predestine who's being saved. Then why does the Bible say God is not God's will that one soul should perish? Okay? He, wants, he wants all men to be saved. It says that, in, you know, Peter says that and Paul tells Timothy that. He wants everybody saved. But he gives people a free will. Even though he's sovereign, he's sovereign over his own sovereignty. He can give people a free will if he chooses. And so, you know, everything doesn't happen according to the will of God. 
and uh, it, uh, we are, God has created within us the ability to choose. The last message of the Bible is what? The spirit and the bride say come, and let him that hears say come, let him that whosoever is thirsty come, uh, whosoever will, let him come and drink of water of life freely. Whosoever exercises his or her will, let them come and drink of the water of life freely, is what he's saying. So God wants everybody saved. And he's able to keep you. Able to keep you. Again, for, I know for walking in light as he himself is in light, we have fellowship one with another. The blood of Jesus Christ keeps cleansing us from all sin. He's writing to Christians, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth isn't in us. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from every unrighteousness. And then he uses the Greek aorist tense. I write these things that you don't sin. Don't commit a single sin. Don't you do it. Don't you? But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So the emphasis is on security. But you can't ignore all these other things. It, the Bible is full of paradoxes like that. God doesn't have trouble with them. We do. We do. And Paul didn't have trouble with them. You know, he talks about the security. I know whom I believe. That's able to keep my deposit against that day. But he also warns. He'll present us holy, unblameable, unreprovable in sight if we continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. That's Colossians chapter 1. So he'll keep us. But you still got a free will. That's why he gives the warning. Beware, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and apostatizing from the living God. Don't keep practicing willful sin. Don't keep doing that. Lay it aside. Stop it. Exercise self-control. Part of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control by the power of the Holy Spirit to say no to sin. Yes. Okay. I mean, we all struggle with sin. I mean, yes. That's right. The blood keeps cleansing. As long as you're struggling, you're okay. It's when you give up and say, I'm going back. <laughs> as long as you're struggling, you're okay. Well, I came. I said. I said. I, I. I said. I came not in the world to condemn the world, but that the world through me might be saved. Uh, yeah, the byproduct, if you don't accept him, is you're condemned already. He goes on to say, because you haven't believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God, the unique Son of God. Yeah, that's a paradox too. Uh, he didn't come to judge the world like he didn't come. He, I, I also says one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law; the law be fulfilled. I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And what's the jot? It's the letter Y, the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the Yod. And the tittle is like the crossing of a T. But when he fulfilled it, when the veil of the temple was ripped in two, he eliminated it. Colossians chapter 2 says he took that law out of the way and nailed it to his cross. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink in respect of a holy day or the new moon or the Sabbath. Those are only a shadow of things to come, but the bodies of Christ. And the book of Galatians gives seven arguments to say he took that he removed the law. It's gone. But we have a higher law, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And again, technically, and I'm out of time. <laughs> okay, I'm already 15 minutes over. Sorry about that. That's a holiday. Uh, the, uh, you know, the book of Colossians and the book of Galatians teach clearly all 10 of the 10 commandments were nailed to the cross. Nine of them are repeated for the Christian in the New Testament. The only one that's not repeated is keeping the Sabbath day. That was strictly for Israel. And that's sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. And they try to say, well, the Sabbath day's been changed. No, it's not. The Sabbath day is sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. But the early church worshiped on what they called the Lord's Day, Resurrection Day. That's why John says, I became in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. That's the technical term for the first day of the week. That's when the early church was worshiping. John was at Troas for seven days, and it was on the first day of the week, it says, when the brothers came together to break bread. But God doesn't care what day you worship on. If God was as legalistic as people are, nobody would be saved. Nobody would be saved. Why do you have to wear your hair this way or this way or this way? Or you got a red shirt on? Or well, How can you do that and be a Christian? Ah! Make mountains out of molehills. Mountains out of molehills. Uh... You've all, heard, uh, you've all heard Randy's song, Where's the Love? <laughs> okay, that he sings in prisons. How can he be a Christian and have all those tattoos and that long hair? Ah, his, his song says, where's the love, man? Where's the love? 
And we get things that don't matter. Don't matter. The big issue is Jesus Christ. He's the whole issue. He's the whole issue. And God's able to keep you. Don't plan on walking away. <laughs> God's able to keep you. God's able to keep you. He's given you a free will and you can still exercise. He made you a robot after you get saved. That's why these warnings are there. So we have to deal with the paradoxes. They're both in the Bible. Both. He doesn't waste words either way. He's able to keep you. But eternal life, he that has the Son has life. If I walk away from the Son, I, I you know the eternal life is still eternal life. I've walked away from it. He that has the Son has life. Okay? All right, well, we're out of time. Father, we're thankful tonight for your love and your amazing grace. Thankful that you're able to keep that that we've committed to you. And we know there's going to come a catching away of the church, and we know, it's, we, we know every prophecy has been fulfilled for that to happen. We know we can't set dates. It could happen tonight. It could be 10 years from now. But your word says we're to live as men and women expecting our Lord. And Father, we see prophecy taking place at warp speed all around us. The one world government is shaping up. All these things are happening ready for the man with all the answers. And your word tells us the dragon, Satan, gives this man his throne and his power and great authority. And your word says in 2 Thessalonians that you yourself are going to send strong delusion to believe the lie because people did not believe the love of the truth that they might be saved. I pray, Father, if there's anyone here tonight that doesn't know your son, speak to their hearts. I wonder as every head is bowed and every eye closed, do you know Jesus? I'm not asking if you want to join this church. We're not the way to heaven. But Jesus is the only way. The Bible says he that has the son has life. And I've quoted that over and over tonight. And he that doesn't have the son does not have life. The Bible says, as many as receive him, he gives power to become the children of God. Do you know Jesus Christ? Have you received him? He said, I've taken my stand at the door and I'm knocking. And if anyone hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in and feast with him and he with me. And if Jesus Christ is living in your life, you know it. The Bible says, we know we've passed from death unto life because he's given us of his spirit. Maybe you're here tonight, you'll say, Pastor Westlake, I'm not sure I'm saved. If I died right now, I'm not sure where I'd spend eternity. I need Jesus Christ in my life. Pray for me. Just lift your hand up and down. Anyone? Always give an invitation anywhere I preach in the world because I went to church 19 years of my life and never knew I could know Jesus. Anyone at all? Anyone at all? Father, I pray that you'll use each person here for your glory. Help us to share the reality of Jesus Christ with others that need to hear, knowing that the time is indeed short. And every one of your people are gifted to tell other people about your love and your amazing grace. We're thankful that you're able to keep us. You're able to present us faultless before the throne of your glory. And that we're innocent, we're cleansed before you by the blood of Jesus Christ, period. Use us all for your glory. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen. Let's give the Lord a big hand for his grace tonight. And greet a bunch of folks on the way out. And again, let them know God loves them.